Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Shaz Kong at Talks at Google. She'll be talking to us about the superpowers of ceiling smashers. After her talk, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Shaz is a business leader who's achieved goals previously thought impossible. She is a serial CEO and board director with a track record of turning around and growing businesses and is a former Nike senior executive. Leading up to her CEO experiences, Shaz had multiple careers as a scientist, partner at a consulting firm, e-commerce expert, brand strategist and marketer. She is also the author of The Closer, the story of the first female CEO of a sports company and the secret society of professional women called the Ceiling Smashers who helped her succeed. Without further ado, here is Shaz Khan. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you, Google, for inviting me. Today, I'm excited to share with you what I call the superpowers of ceiling smashers, the skills you need to succeed and smash the glass ceiling. But first, I'm going to tell you a secret. The secret is that the most disastrous work experiences can actually help you build the skills you need to succeed. And we've all had disastrous work experiences, right? Over the course of my career, through a number of disastrous work experiences, I've learned about 20 or so superpowers. In this talk, I'll share six of them with you. For each one, I'll tell you a story and explain how I learned each superpower. Whether you want to become a CEO or just wish to become more successful in your career, my goal is to make it easier for you. So let's dive in. This first story is the longest and the other ones will go a lot more quickly. So superpower number one, be resourceful. So this story happened after I graduated from Cornell with a degree in food science and chemistry. And I got my first job as a scientist for Kraft Foods, inventing new food prototypes. Uh, as anyone, any person in their first job, I was energized, idealistic, and ready to make an impact. Uh, and my first assignment was to invent synthetic blueberries. I mean, how much more exciting can it get than that, right? So about 10 months into the job, I was really enjoying things, and my boss's boss, a guy named Bob, held a contest across all of the labs, and he invited every scientist to submit two to three new product ideas. Bob would pick the best ones and present them to the incoming new director of R&D. So being an overachiever, like many of you out there, I submitted not two or three, but 15 ideas. The following week, I had to go to talk to Bob's executive assistant about something else, and I happened to glance at her computer screen, and I saw her retyping my list. And I said, oh, you're retyping my list of ideas. How come? And she said, well, uh, Bob had a change. So she showed me the hard copy, and Bob had scratched my name off and put his in its place. I was shocked. I mean, this was early in my career, but I knew this was not right, and I was really upset about it. So I talked to my boss. My boss was you know, a good, good person, a smart woman, and I explained the situation. And she said, Shaz, these things happen. You just have to accept it. And I said, you know, I'm a direct person, and I would like to speak to Bob about this because it's really bothering me. And she said, well, I wouldn't do it, but if you want to, go ahead and try. So I set up a meeting with Bob. And sat down in his office and I said, Bob, I worked really, really hard on coming up with these new product ideas. And these are my original ideas. I don't feel comfortable having you submit them with only your name on them. And I thought he would say, okay, Shaz, you know, let's come to a compromise or, you know, I, I see your point of view. Let's, you know, figure this out. But instead he said, well, I'm in charge and I can do whatever I want. End of discussion. So that meeting did not go as well as I had anticipated. Uh, but there was another senior manager named Earl who was the same level as Bob. And I thought, okay, I'll go ask Earl for help. So I went to Earl, I explained what happened. And he, you know, he thought about it and he said, okay, I'll help you if you help me. And I thought, great. Maybe he wants me to do a special project, some extra lab work. Instead, what he said was, I want you to sleep with me. And I was so young and naive at the time, I, I blurted, why would you need me to sleep with you? You have a wife. And he just rolled his eyes. Um, and he said, that's my offer. Take it or leave it. 
And I said, no thanks. In fact, I think my exact words were, no thanks, I'm not that desperate. So this was a pretty big disaster for me. It was my first job and basically I had my ideas stolen from me. And then when I asked someone for help, I got sexually harassed. I realized that the two most senior guys in R&D were both pretty rotten and I had nobody helping me career-wise. This is actually really important for any of you, especially in your first job. If you have no one looking out for you, you really have to figure out how to create your own opportunities. I also had another realization around that time. We scientists were coming up with new ideas and presenting them to marketing, and then marketing would choose which ones they wanted to fund. And I didn't think they were always picking the ideas with the most consumer appeal. And I wanted to be in the position to make those decisions someday. So I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to run a business or a company someday. But when I looked around, I really didn't see any CEOs that were scientists. So I realized I needed to get an MBA and I started applying to business schools. Uh, a couple months later, a situation arose that changed the, the course of my career completely. I was invited to present a product development update to the VP of marketing. And, and my boss's boss, Bob, had invited me to present because my work was very technical and he said he wasn't sure if he could answer all the questions. So uh, I went to the meeting, made the presentation, and the VP of marketing was a guy named Dave, who was a great marketer, and he had a very diverse team, and I was really impressed with how collaborative he was with his team. And I thought, this is exactly the kind of person I need to get to know. So after the meeting ended, I, I chased Dave down the hall, and I said, Dave, I really was impressed with your marketing savvy and your leadership style. And I'm actually planning on getting my MBA probably in marketing. So I was wondering, can I buy you lunch sometime so I can pick your brain about marketing? And to my surprise, he said yes. So by the time I got back to the lab, I already had a lunch invitation from his assistant, which was great. So the lesson I actually learned here was that uh, you need to make appropriate requests at appropriate times. My first step was just getting him to talk to me. If I asked him to mentor me right away, that would have been too big of, a, too big of an ask right away. Another thing I, I figured out was that when you establish a relationship with a senior executive, you've got to make it mutually beneficial and you've got to create demand. I certainly didn't want him to cancel on me before we had our lunch. So I thought, you know, what can I do to ensure that he'll keep our lunch appointment? So I sent him two really interesting articles. One was on competitors' marketing successes and the other was on consumer trends. And then uh, when, we, when I showed up for lunch, I brought him another article. And uh, during the lunch, I bounced off my new product ideas off of him so I could, number one, get his feedback, but number two, let him know that these ideas were mine. And we had such a great conversation. Dave suggested that we meet for lunch at least once a month, which was fantastic. Um, and then around that time, I also had another career changing situation that happened in the company cafeteria. I was having lunch with a bunch of colleagues and the new director of R&D, a guy named Charlie, had joined. And somebody said, oh, there's there's Charlie over there. And so and he was the boss over both Bob and Earl. So I said, I'm going to go say hi. So I went over, introduced myself, welcomed him to the company, and I invited him to stop by my lab sometime. I said, I can show you what I'm working on. And the great thing was Charlie took me up on the offer and he ended up coming by the lab every Friday afternoon and we discussed what I was working on. And the thing that was even greater was that around Friday afternoon, a lot of people would take off early for the weekend. So I was usually the only one left in the lab. So I had a lot of one on one time to brainstorm on different uh, scientific techniques with Charlie. So while there was no formal mentoring program, I ended up having two mentors. Dave, the VP of marketing, and Charlie, the director of R&D. Uh, I happened to notice around that time a problem with the sample procurement process across all the labs. And then I came up with an idea to fix it. So over one of our lunches, I mentioned it to Dave and he said, that's a great idea. You should, you should lead this effort. And I said, no way. Bob would never allow me to do this. And Dave said, no, you should do it. You really should. He said, don't worry, I'll clear the path for you. So uh, when I got back to the lab, I don't know what Dave did, but Bob came over and congratulated me on the special assignment, and he even offered to help me. And um, Dave had also connected me with the head of procurement to work with me on it. 
So my teammate and I worked on this and we came up with a solution that we thought was really workable. And we presented it to Charlie who said, this is terrific, but in order to move this ahead, you need to get the support of the VP of R&D, a guy named Rick. As I was learning, it was a big company, many, many layers to get through. But Charlie said, the only problem is that Rick's calendar is booked months and months out. He's like, you're never gonna get a slot on his calendar. And we thought, well, we really wanna show him this information. How can we, how we can get in front of him? So I happened to talk to Rick's assistant and I found out that Rick worked out in the company gym every morning at 5.30 a.m. alone. So I came up with this idea to create this Mission Impossible style audio tape explaining the problem and our solution. My teammate and I worked on the tape and we even had the music. We slipped it to the gym manager the night before and by 9 a.m. the next morning, we were called to Rick's office. He loved the tape, he was enthusiastic about the program and he wanted us to start implementing it right away. So what was the outcome of all of these experiences in my first job? Well, with my regular lab work, I filed three patent applications, all of which ended up with Bob's name on them. That was a bummer. But on the upside, the sample procurement effort I led saved the company $1.3 million in the first six months of operation. And for that, I won the director's award. Um, and I had already been accepted to business schools and had decided to attend Wharton. Then I was awarded a craft leadership fellowship, which provided a full scholarship to Wharton, which was amazing. <laughs> I was so happy. So these were things that I would never have gotten if I hadn't been resourceful or tried seeking out opportunities or connected with people that I really respected. So the superpower here is be resourceful. Find ways to create opportunities for yourself, make appropriate requests at appropriate times, and establish mutually beneficial mentor relationships. Superpower number two, respond with resilience. So this was after I had gotten my MBA, I had joined a strategy consulting firm, and this was the first consulting project that I was working on. I was working on it with the partner in charge of the office, just the two of us were working on the project. So we were working on the project for a while, and then we were going to present our findings and recommended strategy to the client at an offsite at a private country club in rural Pennsylvania. The client attendees were the board of directors and the entire senior executive team. So the first day of meetings went really well, and while everybody else went up to the bar for a drink, I stayed in the meeting room downstairs to prepare everything for the next day. And then finally, I got everything set up, I went up to the bar and walked up to the, the bartender and I ordered a drink, and the bartender looked shocked, and he kind of took a step back and I said, um, you know, excuse me, I'd like to order this drink, and he said, I'm sorry, miss, I can't serve you. And I looked very young at the time. So I said, no, I assure you, I'm of legal drinking age. You know, I can, I can drink. So can I please have this drink? And he said, no, I'm sorry, I can't serve you. You're, you're not allowed in here. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And he said, you know, did you see in the sign? And he pointed over the door and there was a sign that said, gentlemen only. And I said, are you kidding? That's not an antique. And he said, no, I'm afraid that's the rule of the bar. And I couldn't believe it. I was getting kicked out of the bar because I was a woman and I happened to be the only woman at the entire meeting. So I turned to look at the partner to try to get his help and he looked at the floor and just avoided my gaze. And by then everyone had stopped talking in the room and everyone was watching me to see what was gonna happen next. So I turned back to the bartender and I said, okay, look, here's what we're gonna do. Would you make me my drink please? And I will take it outside and enjoy it there. And then I turned around to all the men at the, inside the bar and said, okay, we've been cooped up inside all day, so I'm going to go out on the terrace and enjoy the sunset, and anyone is welcome to join me. So I got my drink, walked down the hall, and went out on the terrace. And I was so upset about this whole thing, and uh, I was also alone for a while. But I just thought, okay, you've gotta just relax, and get recentered. So I took a few deep breaths and then I started looking around and there was just, you know, beautiful rolling green hills and a magenta sunset. And I just started to relax and said, let me just enjoy this moment of peace. Uh, a little while later, I heard a voice behind me and this voice said, is this a private sunset or may I join you? And I turned around, it was the client CEO. I said, this is an equal opportunity sunset, pull up a chair. 
And I was so thankful to the CEO for coming out and joining me. And I thought that just spoke volumes about this, this person's leadership. I really respected that. Um, and he said, I like how you handled yourself back there. And I said, thank you, but you've got to do something about that rule. <laughs> Can you please get them to change it? And he said he would work on it and he apologized. And I realized something that this was just a golden opportunity because throughout the entire project, I had never had a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with the CEO. And I had so many questions that I was wondering about. So I thought this is my opportunity to ask all those questions. So we had a fantastic conversation and over the course of 15 to 20 minutes, the other executives slowly trickled out onto the terrace. So it ended up being a good evening. The next day, we were in our second day of meetings presenting our strategy, and then all of a sudden the CEO said, I'd like to take a 15 minute break so I can confer with my consultant. And so everybody scattered, and then the partner I was working with ran over to the CEO, and the CEO said, no, no, not you, I want to, I want to talk to Shaz, and he motioned me over, and I thought, oh no, I'm being called out for a second time. And he said, we had a really great conversation last night about the changes, changes I'm trying to make in my organization and, and the culture that I'm trying to instill in the organization. So based on what you know, what I'm trying to do with the company, do you think the strategy will still work or do we need to change it? And I said, you know, I really think the strategy will work, but based on what you're trying to do, we really need to change how we're executing it. And here's some of the things that I would change. So it was amazing to me because this really well-respected CEO was asking a 20-something year old consultant for their ideas. And I just, it really was the, the moment where I, I learned to love consulting and just felt like I could make an impact. So the superpower here is respond with resilience. Recover quickly from a bad situation and take a terrible situation and turn it to your advantage because you never know where it will lead. All right, moving on to superpower number three. Be your own best advocate. So there are a number of aspects about being your own best advocate, but I'm going to share two of them with you. The first one is stand up to bullies. I was working with a consulting manager who was very chauvinistic and a bully, to, especially to women. And we were in a meeting together where he had to leave early. And with the client team that I was working with, I managed to persuade them to um, get us a meeting with the president of the company. And this was something the manager I had been working with was trying to do for months with no success. But I managed to finagle this meeting with the president of the client business. So I was pretty excited about it, went back to the team room and shared the news with this manager. And his response really surprised me. He started bullying me right away and in this you know booming voice said, never schedule a meeting with a senior executive without my express permission. I was like, whoa, 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 time out. I said, no, no, no. You and I are having a private conversation in the conference room down the hall, follow me. And we went down to the, to the conference room and I said, first of all, I do not appreciate nor will I accept being spoken to in that manner. And secondly, I got a meeting with the president of the client business, which is something you've been trying to do for months. So I would expect a little gratitude. And I think he was very surprised that I stood up to him. And I had a heated discussion with him, but I gained his respect. And he never bullied me again. And we ended up working really well together. I, over the course of time, I gave him feedback on his style. And he worked really hard to change it. And ultimately, we ended up working in two companies together and even became golf buddies. So it, it turned out well. The second aspect of being your own best advocate is practicing quid pro quo. Easy to say. Quid pro quo is Latin for something for something. And it's a basic tenet of how I've seen guys operate, but it's completely different from how women operate. So if somebody at the office asks you a favor, if, if they ask a woman to, to do a favor, the woman will say, sure. And then she'll do a great job. And the person will say, oh, this is so fantastic. Thank you so much. I really owe you one. And the woman will say, oh, forget it. I was happy to help. No problem. Whereas a man will say, yeah, you do owe me one. Men use relationships as strategic assets. And I think this is something that women can learn to do more of. When I was an executive at Nike, I had a colleague, we'll call Frank, and I saw somebody conspiring to get him fired unfairly. So I called Frank up at home in the evening and I warned him about it and we brainstormed together of what he could do to save his job. So by the next morning, 
he had gotten ahead of the situation. He kept his job and he was so grateful to me. And he said, I promise I'll do anything, anything you ask in the future, anything, anytime you need help, you call me. So years later, Frank and I had moved on to other companies. And in Frank's corporation, there was a business in really poor shape that I was interested in running. So I asked Frank to introduce me to the corporate CEO. And I was very surprised by his response. He said, well, if I introduce you to the CEO, he's going to realize that your skills are superior to the guy who's running the business. And he'll hire you and he'll fire the guy that's running the business. And he said, you know, um, so that's a problem. I said, why is that a problem? He said, well, because the guy running the business is my friend and uh, I feel bad if he got fired. So no, I'm not going to introduce you. And I didn't like his response, but I accepted it. What a blockhead I was. I didn't advocate for myself. I didn't call in the favor that Frank owed me. And as a result, I missed out on an opportunity to run a business that I was really excited about. A few months later, the guy running the business was still struggling and was, was replaced anyway by a more qualified woman who ended up doing a terrific job. So the superpower here, here is be your own best advocate. Number one, stand up to bullies. You only need to do this once to set the tone. And two, practice quid pro, pro quo. Don't forget to call in favors that are owed to you. Superpower number four, find your fit. This one was a lesson, a hard earned lesson, but um, there's a fallacy that if a woman performs well, she's guaranteed career success. And from my own disastrous work experience, I know that's not always true. When I was a manager at a consulting firm, I had just sold the biggest project in the firm's history to a client in Atlanta. The president of my firm called me in for a chat and I thought, oh, this is exciting. He wants to congratulate me. So I went in to see the president of my firm and he said, congratulations on selling the biggest project in the history of our firm. This is so exciting. I was like, yes, thank you. And then he dropped a bombshell. He said, we need to make a change. The client CFO wants to replace you with a new leader or he won't sign the project, the, the project contract. And I was really confused. I said, but my team and I delivered the first project ahead of schedule, under budget, with three times the revenue benefits we predicted. And I assumed they were happy with the project and me or they wouldn't have bought more work. So what's the problem? What was the problem? My race and my gender. I was shocked to learn that the client wanted to replace me with a white male manager. It's really a disaster to hear, you did a great job, you had an amazing outcome, but you were expendable because you're a woman of color. So I asked the president, okay, this client made an unreasonable request. What are you going to do? And the president said, president said well, what can I do? It's too much money to walk away from. And you know, he said, I really have no choice. And I said, you do have a choice, a choice. You could do the right thing. And he said, well, this is what we're going to do. And I said, I'm really disappointed in your decision. And uh, by the way, you have a daughter, don't you? So over the dinner table tonight, I would like for you to tell your daughter about the situation and tell her about your decision and see what she thinks about it. So in the end, I was replaced with a white male manager. And after a couple of months, he was really struggling. So my firm asked me to lead from behind, which meant I had to dial in early to client conference calls, remain silent, listen to the call, and then afterwards help the manager solve all the problems that came up on the calls. Eventually, the client CEO called me to apologize and he asked me to come back and lead the project, but I was already headed off to Asia to work on something else. And anyway, I really didn't want to go back to that client. Uh, throughout all this, I became smarter about how things worked at my firm, and I was up for partner promotion, and my firm told me, uh, we have to delay your promotion by six to nine months. I said, why do you have to delay it? And they said, well, if we promote you sooner than that, then you will have the shortest tenure ever to make partner. And I said, well, I've earned it. I, I'm, I've been consistently the top seller in the firm, and I've won multiple client awards for quality of work. So I said, look, I'll give you three months to promote me. And if I leave, you'll lose all the revenue I bring in. And knowing that they'd made previous decisions based on money, I knew I was speaking their language. And I also had two really great mentors helping me and they helped me work the political system. So three months later, I became the youngest and the first female minority partner in the firm's 70 year history. 
But I never forgot the experience of being replaced because of my race and gender. I knew the values of my firm were not aligned with mine. There's a great book I just want to mention called True North by Bill George, and it gives examples of extremely successful people, but it shows how they weren't successful until they were able to join a company where the company's values were aligned with theirs. So in my case, I knew it wasn't the right place for me in the long term, and I left as a partner, which was highly unusual. So the superpower here is find your fit. You cannot be successful in a place where your values aren't aligned with the company's values. Know when it's time to walk away and have the courage to leave if it's not the right place for you. Superpower number five, what I call ABC or always be confident. This happened when I took over the Nike cycling business and the CEO told me I was the first woman to hold a global business p and at Nike. No pressure. Uh, so the cycling business was a mess. It had been kicked out of many retail accounts. It had very high product returns and many consumer complaints. It had been run for about seven years by a former pro track cyclist, but it hadn't made a cent since the inception of the business. And the CEO told me, just fix it. So my team that I inherited was a mostly male team, all avid cyclists, and pretty much everyone asked me the same two questions. The first was, how much do you know about the sport of cycling? And the second was, how much do you know about the business of cycling? And I answered honestly, not much, but I do know how to ride a bike. <laughs> but I don't think they appreciated my sense of humor that much. Uh, and a couple of guys told me to my face, I don't think you can do this job. So this was a disaster. I had inherited a business in terrible shape with a team that didn't think I was qualified to do the job. And I have to admit, I, their skepticism was a blow to my confidence. But then I took a step back and thought, wait a minute, this business has been tanking for years and has been losing money the whole time. And these are the people who've been working on it. How can I possibly do any worse? Uh, so I told the team, look, I do know how to turn around a business and I do know how to turn around a brand. I will learn the cycling sport and business from you guys. And I'm sure you'll learn something from me as well. Anyway, who wants to work for a failing business? Let's do some innovation, let's work together, collaborate and make this a success. So my first big team meeting that I had, it was a big cross-functional meeting and I was surprised to learn that even though these guys had worked on the, the, the business for many years, um, some of them had actually never met in person. Um, but what I did was something interesting. I had about 20 pairs of cycling shorts that I laid out across the, the long conference room table. And I held up an iPod shuffle and I said, okay, I've got a prize for anyone who can correctly guess the size of each of the shorts on the table without looking at the tags. So people got excited and they started going down the line, extra large, extra small, medium, small, small, large. So I said, all right, are those your final answers? They said, yes. I said, guess what? All these shorts, all medium sized. And they, were, they varied so greatly. I said, we're not using standardized sizing specifications or fit blocks. And that's why our sizing varies so greatly from style to style and season to season. And that's why our returns are the highest in the company. And I methodically took the team through all of the key aspects of the business so we could discover together why all these major problems existed and what we could do about them. Then around March, um, I was having a meeting with the team to discuss our sponsorship of the Tour de France, which is a huge cycling event that many tourists attend. So I talked to the team and said, okay, what do we have? What kind of special products are we going to offer around the Tour de France? And they said, well, we have some t-shirts, we have some replica jerseys. And I said, well, what's that like must have item that people are really gonna wanna buy? And they said, we don't have anything like that. So I said, all right, well, why don't we do a bag? And they said, forget it, Shaz. If we wanted to, it takes two years to do a bag at Nike. If we wanted to do a bag, we should have started on it two years ago. There's no way we can get it done. It's crazy. And because this was March and we had to have the product into the stores by June. So they said, just forget about it. Uh, you don't understand how things work. So I said, all right, well, I'm going to look into it further and I might ask some of you for help. So stay tuned. So I ended up finding an early bag design from our European team and I had a couple of designers in Beaverton helping me. And we also found a quick turn bag manufacturer in China that was already Nike approved. 
So we got the bag designed, developed, and delivered to the stores in two months, which was a record at Nike. And it was a pretty complicated bag too, because it had both laser printing and embroidery. But we, we put the bag out on the market and it sold out and it was very exciting. I also made a bag up for each of the senior executives at Nike with a special tag on it that said this bag was designed, developed, delivered to the stores in two months. And these are the people who made it happen. And so one of my teammates said, so Phil Knight has a bag with my name on it. And I said, yes, he does. So the rest of the, for the rest of the team, I think they learned two important lessons. The first was that it is possible to, uh, to take a new approach to something and have a successful outcome. And the second was that if you're on the team and you put forth extra effort, your um, contributions will be recognized and rewarded. So the next time I had a crazy idea, people were much more receptive and ready to work with me on it. So after about a year and a half, we grew revenues 300% and made the business profitable for the first time in history. So the superpower here, ABC, or always be confident. Be a confident leader, because if you don't believe in yourself, then no one else will. And even at times when you're feeling uncertain, you must project confidence if you want people to follow you. All right, now at the last superpower, superpower number six, which is follow the opportunity, not the crowd. To become a business leader and eventually a CEO, you have to get the opportunity. And as you know, it's very tough, especially as a woman, to get your first CEO role. People just don't want to hire somebody who hasn't done the job before. So how do you get your chance? Don't follow the crowd. Most people want to work for a company that's already really successful. What should you do? Take the job no one wants, the, the job that no one thinks can be done. When I was a senior executive at Nike, I had run some businesses successfully and wanted to run another one. The CEO said, we'd love for you to run another business, but we've just reorganized and we don't have anything yet. Can you wait two to three years and we'll find something for you? I thought, mm, no, <laughs> I was too impatient. I realized this is my opportunity to go after what I really want, which is a CEO role. So I left Nike. I did a lot of research and I targeted five companies, all of which were doing terribly. These were companies with potential, but needed to be turned around. So I wrote compelling letters to the corporate CEO or the board chairman, and I got a 100% response rate and met with all of them. I ended up taking the role of president CEO of Lucy Activewear, a company that made activewear uh, clothing for women, which had never made money in its 12 year history. Why was this attractive to me? Well, the active, I knew that the activewear sector was the main growth driver for the entire apparel industry for the past decade, growing in the high double digits. So the sector was very healthy, but this company was broken. So I thought there's upside if we can just fix the company. So I showed up my first day to be introduced to the company and my boss told me he had already announced the layoffs in connection with moving the headquarters from Portland, Oregon to the Bay Area. Now this company had over 800 employees across the US, but at headquarters there were 135 employees. So when he announced the layoffs, he told me that out of 135 people at headquarters, they were keeping only seven. So I was, quite surprised. And I said, how am I supposed to run a company with only seven people? And he said, well, you're in charge. That's for you to figure out. Nice, huh? So he also told me I only had three years to turn it around. Um, and in the first four months, we physically moved the company, hired an entirely new team, changed out our IT systems and our factory sourcing base. We also revamped our strategy, product offering, merchandising, marketing, retail operations, e-commerce, uh, supply chain, pretty much every aspect of how we ran the business. Despite the magnitude of change that we had to deal with, my team and I grew revenues and got the company profitable by month 13, nearly two years ahead of corporate expectations. And we also revitalized the brand and changed the corporate culture. So the superpower here is follow the opportunity, not the crowd. If you want to open up possibilities for yourself, go for the job no one wants, but that you think you can do well. You'll have much more impact going into a challenging business situation than joining a venture that's already successful. So even within a great company like Google, look for opportunities where you believe there's potential and where you can have an impact. So to wrap up, let's sum up the superpowers that I've shared with you. Number one, be resourceful. Number two, respond with resilience. 
Three, be your own best advocate. Four, find your fit. Five, ABC or always be confident. And six, follow the opportunity, not the crowd. Learning from my disastrous work experiences, I hope you now have some additional skills to help you succeed and reach the C-suite. Please use these superpowers and most importantly, share them with others. And remember, success isn't just about skill, it's also about will. Whenever you encounter adversity or someone is holding you back from achieving your goals, do not let it stop you, ever. Thank you. Now, Nadia, I'm happy to answer any questions we have. Great, excellent. Um, Shaz, hearing about all your challenges and how you overcame them has been incredibly helpful. I have a couple of questions and then we'll take questions from Googler. There are many. First, I wanted to say that I really loved reading your book, The Closer, and I found it so refreshing to read about positive portrayals of senior professional women. I particularly loved when The Closer says, don't let your successes go to your head and don't let your failures get to your heart. Um, what made you want to write this book and what is your second book about and when is it coming out? Uh, well, the reason why I wrote The Closer was because whenever I read a fiction book where it had a female business leader as a character, she was always portrayed in a negative light and always portrayed as you know trying to quash the careers of other women. And I know so many amazing, inspirational, positive female leaders, and I thought nobody is writing about them or for them. So I wanted to provide a fresh take on women in business. And that's why I wrote the book. I just wanted to fill a void in the literary marketplace. So uh, the second book is actually about, um, it's called Smasher Synced, and it will be published in probably mid-January 2021, and it will be available on Amazon and Audible. And it's about the other founders of the Ceiling Smasher Society and what's going on with them as, as Vivian Lee, the character in the first book, is going through her journey. And then I'm going to write a third book that brings everything together. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, second question. I know you've recently relocated from the Bay Area back to the East Coast. Uh, what are you looking to do next? Well, I'm really looking at uh, board director opportunities and some advisor roles. So I'd like to find maybe two to three board director opportunities for consumer oriented businesses. So I'm excited to see what's out there. Great. Um, so let's open up for questions from Googlers. We have many. Um, the first one is from Ora Castillo Daza. Uh, great tip about standing up to bullies. It is sad, but sometimes the bullies are women leaders. Have you encountered those and how do you stand up to them? The bullies, sometimes you got to let them, you know, kind of run their own course. But, you know, obviously, sometimes you also have to stand up. To them but i think you know the best thing is trying to be gracious and trying to show that you want to collaborate with them and i think if they see you're not a threat and you want to help them you know you can advance the relationship thank you um another question from nakia shaney uh there are many times in your stories that i would have reacted or quit the job uh, how do you distinguish between when to be resilient and stick it out and when to seek different opportunities? Well, I think part of it was, I think you have to look at sunk costs. And with the consulting firm that I was with, I knew I was pretty close to making partner. And even though they had replaced me with a, you know, a white male manager, I was, you know, furious about it. But I thought I have worked so hard and contributed so much. I am not leaving here without the thing that I want the most, which is, you know, the partner title. So in that case, I was like, yeah, I need to stick it out until I get this and then I can do whatever I want. I did have a one work situation where I was only with the company for two months and I went in to work with the CEO and found out that um, he was doing some very unethical things and I, and he was also really abusive to the people in the company. And I went into him and I said, I cannot work here another day. Um, I just, I'm not comfortable with the way you're running the business and I just, I can't stay here. And he said, do you have another job lined up? And I said, no, but it's so bad. I, I am not willing to stay another day. And I actually had just sold a project to a client and the client said, we're not going to buy the work unless you have Shaz running it. So 
the CEO called me and he said, you know, can you come back to the firm? I said, here's what I'll do. I'll do the project and I'll lead the team, but I don't want to have any contact with you. And, you know, that's, that's how it's going to work or, you know, you can lose the business. So I did that project and then I didn't have anything else to do with him. So it's, I think you have to use your own intuition and your own gut and figure out, is this something I can stick out? Is there a goal that I'm trying to work towards? If not, if it's just an untenable situation, it's better to get out of there fast. Thank you. Um, another question from Julie Barriere. I've seen women who stand up for themselves or try to impact change in their org labeled high maintenance or drama queens from male leadership. How can we change the narrative to be positive? Yeah, I think women can help other women accomplish this. And actually men can help other women accomplish this. You know, I have been in meetings where, you know, it's I've been the only woman and guys were talking negatively about another woman. And I said, uh, wait a minute, I think she was actually trying to accomplish this goal. And I think that's something that's really admirable. So why are we talking about this in a negative way? I mean, when we see this kind of behavior, it's up to anyone to to try to course correct and, and move it in the right direction. And, you know, I think part of, I think one of the characteristics of, of being a CEO is that you kind of, you know, buck the trend and you don't always follow, you know, along peacefully. And I think that's okay, you know, but I think you also have to be selective about the things that you're trying to fight for. And um, I think, you know, if you do it in a positive way that shows there's an upside for the business, then, you know, ultimately it should be received in a more positive way. Great. Um, another question from Priscilla Munoz. Can you talk more about resiliency? Specifically, how do you not let failures overshadow your accomplishments and or negative feedback undermine your confidence? Yeah, this is, I mean, it's something that I think you just really, when you encounter these situations, it just takes practice to develop this skill. Um, but I do think, you know, after I had that situation, you know, with getting kicked out of the bar and everything, and then I had the next project I was on um, and I was doing a big presentation and I, I told the partner, I'm, I said, I'm really nervous. You know, I didn't have such a great experience in my first project. And I'm, I'm nervous about making this presentation to all of these client executives and, you know, what's going to happen. And, and this guy was such a huge help. He said, look, you have done, you know, an incredible amount of work on this project. He said, you know, this material better than anyone. He said, you know, it better than anyone in that room. He said, there's no question they can ask you that you can't answer. So he said, you've just got to, you know, Forget about what happened in the past. This is a new beginning. Just get in there, do your best, and I'm sure you're going to do great. And, you know, if, if something, if there's a problem, you know, I can help you or I'm sure you can handle it yourself. So I think having people who support you and can help you along the path is, is also a huge component to developing that resiliency. But it's interesting. I was meeting with a group of, of female CEOs and I happened to share that story and one of the CEOs said, you know, if that happened to me and I get kicked out of the bar, I would have just gone back to my room and, you know, just been alone for the evening. And I was like, oh, you know, you can't do that. You know, if this ever happens to you, don't don't give up. You cannot give up. Just, you know, just kind of get back on the horse and and figure out how you could do it differently. And if you feel like you had an experience where you could have done something differently, think, okay, what will I apply next time? And then take those lessons forward with you. Thank you. Um, another question from Patricia Day. How can we differentiate ourselves and make an impact and in this new form of virtual business? Well, I think, you know, at the end of the day, whether a business is, you know, in person or virtual, I think the biggest thing is, showing that you can bring new thinking to the business and showing that you can contribute something that advances the business. So I think in every, um, every job that I've had, this is something I think w was actually very helpful for me in every job that I had, I always, before I started, I always thought, what are the experiences or skills that I want to develop as, you know, a result of taking this job and what do I want to contribute also? So I had those two things, you know, what do I want to get out of it? What do I want to contribute? 
And, you know, on the contribution side, I always thought, okay, what are some of the major issues this business is facing? If I were the CEO of this business, what would be, you know, the most critical things that I want to focus on? And so I try to come up with ideas that would help in those areas. And I think if you can show, you know, excellence in what you're doing, show that you're trying to, you know, contribute new thinking and innovative thinking to the business, and you actually make significant contributions that you know, add value to the business, those are all ways that you can stand out. And uh, you know, I think even through a virtual business, that's something that's still achievable. Great. Um, another question from Bernice Ho. How do you handle the backlash that comes with advocated, advocating for yourself as men would, both mentally and socially in your workplace, you know, coming out of as aggressive, unpleasant? Yeah, this is a balance that I think is a little delicate. So uh, I think there's some cases where you do need to be aggressive. I mean, I remember I was in a meeting in Nike and I was presenting some ideas and everybody in the meeting agreed with the ideas and we were going to move forward. There was one guy who was just, he just wanted to be difficult. And he was saying, uh, I, don't, I don't agree. I don't want to do this. And I said, well, okay, what's your reason for not wanting to go ahead? And he said, I, I just don't, I just don't want to. I don't, I don't. <laughs> and he was just being kind of a, you know, difficult person. So um, I said, all right, well, maybe we should go outside and settle this. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you know, you and I just go outside, you know, <laughs> by the way, I'm, you know, second degree black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> and I told him, this will take less than 30 seconds. We'll be back. And, and he was like, um, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, I agree. <laughs> so, you know, but I think there's also a great opportunity to use humor. And I think if you can, if there's a difficult situation and you can use humor, that helps a lot in terms of not, you can be seen as assertive and, you know, confident, but it kind of takes the edge off the aggressiveness a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's definitely times when you, you do need to be a little aggressive to stand up for yourself. And, you know, and those are the times that you've got to do it. <laughs> Great. Um, another question uh, from Ora Castillo Daza. Uh, taking the job nobody wants may also be a risky one. Um, do you think there are times in our lives where it is better to be more conservative? Uh, I do. I think it depends on what it is you're you're seeking to do. So if you are still on the stage in your career where you're trying to build a skill set or you're trying to get a certain set of experiences so you'll be prepared to move to the next job or the next level, you might not want to take the, the job that nobody wants, but uh, there it not doesn't necessarily have to be the job nobody wants. It could be a project nobody wants, or it could be a presentation that nobody wants to give, or it could be you know a meeting that nobody wants to lead, but you step in. And I think if there are still opportunities, no matter where you are in your career, where you can find. Uh, a chance to distinguish yourself. And it might be in small ways at first, but you'll ultimately, you know, build up and get to the, uh, the chance where you're like, okay, you know, now I'm ready to, you know, take on something bigger. And I mean, you know, Nadia, you and I have talked about how, you know, sometimes women, you know, they're trying to get a CEO role and, you know, they might take something that's like, you know, just not the right situation, but they really want to take that role. So you've got to think about it really carefully and, and look at all the risks and look at the downside potential, um, but also look at, you know, what you, you could potentially contribute and what you could get out of it. And I think the nice thing about going into a situation that's pretty bad is that, you know, it's already bad. So it's very difficult to make it worse. <laughs> so normally, <laughs> the only way it can go is up. So it usually pays off to take the risk. Great. Um, another question from Erica Gruel. Uh, vulnerability as a leader can have its advantages and can be used against women. You spoke about showing confidence first. When is it advantageous to be vulnerable? I think it's advantageous, advantageous to be vulnerable when you're faced with a situation where you uh, are lacking in knowledge about a certain area. And, you know, I think uh, in the cycling business at Nike, you know, I did, I admitted, hey, I don't know much about the cycling business or the sport, and uh, but I'm a quick study and I'm going to learn it and I'm going to learn it from you. Um, but 
you know, I think there's a, a slight difference, which is having a can-do attitude, even if you're showing vulnerability. Um, and uh, I think if you can balance both, then you can, you know, achieve the outcomes that you're you're looking to achieve. Um, I, I do think, you know, I see this actually with women more so than men. I think a lot of times women um, are more, I, I don't know, they they are more maybe realistic or or um, maybe pessimistic. I should say they're a little more pessimistic about their their skills and capabilities and. I've coached many women where I've said, hey, you can do this job. I know you can do this job. Don't sell yourself short. Go for this bigger job. I know you can do it. Just, you know, just take a chance. And uh, it's okay to say that you don't know things. But as long as you say, I have a plan to learn, you know, these are the things I don't know. This is my plan to learn them. And I'm going to get it to speed in three months. Then that reduces people's um, nervousness about whether you can take on something bigger. Great. Um, okay, so we have four minutes left and many questions still. Let me, let's talk about uh, the last two questions. How do you find what's broken within a complex system? This is from Stephanie Gibbs. How do you find what's broken? I mean, does that, I, I guess that means in terms of the business issues or? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, what I like to do, actually, I think the simplest way to do it, especially if it's a consumer oriented business, is I put myself in the consumer's shoes and I say, you know, if I were a consumer and I kind of map out what would be my journey in dealing with this business or uh, interacting with this company and what are the major issues I see, what are the obstacles, who's doing it well, you know, who's doing it much better than we could possibly imagine. And uh, I mean, there are many, many approaches that you take to, you know, breaking apart a strategy and figuring out if it's working and looking at the product and looking at the product roadmap and figuring out, you know, do you have things in place that will allow you to defend your position? But I think for me, the, one of the key things has been really putting yourself in the, the, in the shoes of the consumer or the user and um, figuring out what are some innovations that this consumer has never seen that we can deliver. And I think if you can not only fix the, what's broken in the system and then provide new thinking and new approaches, you know, that's the best combination of all. Great. Uh, last question. Uh, how do you know a job is right for you? This is from Kathy Lehman. How do you know that it will bring you happiness and contentment? Hmm. I don't know if a job can bring you happiness and contentment. Uh, maybe, you know, working for the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders or something, or maybe Google. Um, I think what you really need to think about is, you know, what are the values of the business? What are they trying to achieve? Do I feel like it's a noble cause? Do I feel like I'm going to make a contribution? Am I going to learn something? Um, but I also think, you know, you need to, I'll always figure out for yourself, what is it that makes you happy? What are your motivated skills? What are the things that you're really good at that you actually really enjoy doing? And is this job uh, allowing you to use those motivated skills well? And uh, I would also say, you know, there's got to be, I mean, everybody talks about work-life balance and I, I think that's a real misnomer and it's kind of a fallacy, but uh, I think what you need to figure out is what's important to you at certain points in your life and your career. And for me, I did make a big mistake when um, my husband and I were expecting twins. I was CEO of Lucy Activewear. I took a two week maternity leave and went back to work. And I, if I had to do it over again, I would not have done that. I mean, that's a time where, you know, you need to have time with your family. And I was so exhausted and frazzled and, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody to do that. So I think at different points in your life, you have to figure out what's the most important. And then if you're focusing on that, that will make you the happiest, whether it's, you know, community service, friendships, you know, building a new skill outside of work. There's just so many things that can bring you contentment and joy. And uh, those things will change over time. So just make sure you're always thinking about what it is that you want to be focusing on. Great. Thank you so much, Chess. Uh, it has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye, everyone.